Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, I wanted to start by just opening us up um, in prayer and, and just reflecting on some of the stuff that's uh, been going on this week. Um, first would be the the hurricanes that have hit Louisiana. Uh, there's a lot of devastation, um, uh, not as much loss of life at this point, being Thursday that they know of. Um, but I just wanted to, to start by lifting them up in prayer. And then I also wanted to um, just just voice the um, the Jacob Blake uh, shooting incident that happened and how um, there's a lot of emotion and uh, feelings that are uh, happening in all of us and um, I just, I wanted to, to bring that before the Lord um, as a community and, and just kind of open that up for prayer as well. Um, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll lead us. God, we, um, we come to you when, when we don't know what to do and, and we don't know what to say. And, um, God, I just want to say that we trust you. We uh, we surrender to you. Um, we come to you in times like this for strength and and for wisdom and discernment. And God, I um, I pray for uh, Louisiana and all the other places that are getting hit uh, by this hurricane or have been hit. Um, God, I pray that uh, loss of life would be at a minimum and that. Um, that there would just be really cool stories of how um, uh, your people have shown up to, to help um, those neighborhoods. And God, I, I pray for Jacob Blake and, and his family um, and for the kids that were there um, and just how devastating that uh, encounter and experience is. And God, I ask for healing. I ask for forgiveness. Um, and just that you would... Um, create something beautiful out of this out of this mess that we've made um, and God we, we ask for justice and for this to end and um, we, we don't know what else to do in this moment but just look to you and and just kind of sit at your feet in it um, so God we love you and uh, we're going to sing some songs to you amen
Cause I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. Where else can I go? There's no other name by which I am saved. Capture me with grace and I will follow you. Yes, I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. Where else can I go? There's no other name by which I am saved. Capture me with grace and I will follow you. I will follow you And Father, we love you We worship and adore
You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sin You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling You are true, you are true Even in my wandering You are joy, you are joy You're the reason that I sing You are life, you are life And you death has lost its sting And oh, I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever reign You are more, you are more Than my words will ever say You are Lord, you are Lord All creation will proclaim You are here, you are here In your presence I made all You are God, you are God Of all else I'm letting go And oh, I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. My heart will sing no other name. It's Jesus, my heart will sing, no other name, it's Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing, no other name, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, my heart sing no other name it's Jesus it's Jesus and oh I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever reign Amen God uh, we just thank you for uh, this time that we got to worship you I just ask that you would help us process you would Help us to see how you are moving in these circumstances and, and move us, God. Push us to, to know where to be, to, to be your hands and feet, to be the change, to help bring about justice and peace. Because um, we know you're about those things. And um, in Jesus' name, we love you. Amen. It's Brandy Ford uh, from Greenhouse. Miss you all very much. Uh, today we're going to be talking about house churches. Uh, super excited about you know doing this during this season. It's very important that um, we're going to be moving in the direction of house churches for the foreseeable future. 
Uh, it's going to be about 10 to 15 people uh, in each house. So there's a couple things we want to be able to do together is worship and pray and lift each other up. And so this is a great way to do it. Uh, I encourage you to sign up on the weekly. And tell us your name, your phone number, your email address, and then what neighborhood you live in so that we can hook you up with someone close by. I live in Park Lake Highland. I'm super excited. This week I'm going to be hosting some wonderful people in my home, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable, that's totally okay. Um, we encourage you to try to text somebody or say, hey, you know, let's watch this together. So just so that we can start, you know, getting a little momentum moving forward as far as moving towards gathering again. Uh, today at 2 o'clock, there's a Zoom call. Uh, Ryan is going to be facilitating that, and he's going to be talking about being a teacher. And so if you feel that that is something that you are drawn to do and that God has gifted you with, we would love for you to be on that Zoom call. Uh, Ryan will be providing a space to dive in deeper into what it means to have the gift of being a teacher and to help anyone who thinks they might be gifted in teaching. Come ready to ask some questions and hear stories and sign up for the link on the weekly. And lastly, I am so thankful for my church family. So many of you reached out to me and sent me cards and done wonderful things. I had some Ezra hieroglyphs and uh, things like that from your children that have really meant a lot to me. I am so thankful to have a church family and I am so thankful to have an outlet to uh, share my faith with you and uh, with our children. So just want to say thank you for that and I hope you have a wonderful week. Peace be with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to City Beautiful Church. My name is Ryan. We're continuing this series called Charismata, where we're examining the spiritual gifts as the specific ways that God has equipped you and me uh, to participate in his redemption of the world, in loving people back into relationship with him. And today, we're going to be looking at two uh, gifts that are very dear to me, hospitality and giving. Uh, so I'm going to pray, and we're just going to jump right into this. And so, Heavenly Father, um, we testify to the truth that you are here, that you are with us, that you are for us, you are not against us. God, I thank you time and again for how you're revealing yourself to us in these trying times, um, that you continue to uh, offer yourself as our peace, as our guidepost, as our hope. And Lord, as we're uh, working through these things in our series, as we're engaging with the world around us, um, as we're trying to make sense of chaos and darkness, uh, may we continue to always look to you um, for who we truly are and what we're called to be in this moment in history. And so may the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts be ever pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I was thinking about these two gifts earlier in the week and, and, and you know, I've, I've bundled a few of them as we've gone along because there's some kind of uh, guiding force behind certain groups of gifts. Uh, kind of a similar lesson that we can learn um, through the gifts about the character of God, about our responsibility, especially this year as we're talking about maturing in Christ for the sake of the world. And these two gifts really led me to this conclusion about the spiritual gifts in general. That our spiritual gifts work best when we're outwardly focused and other-centered. Because we're created to live as Jesus did. A lot of times we think that our default setting as human beings is our immaturity. And to grow into maturity is to grow into something that is unnatural to us. Um, because it's territory that we haven't yet entered into. Um, but the challenge for me in this is, is am, am I able to believe um, that I am meant to live the way that Jesus lived? Um, that part of the work of salvation is recognizing Jesus as the truly human one and that who Jesus is becomes the destiny for all of us and who we are to become as we're being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, as we're growing and developing in maturity, that actually that's the really real me. And when I look at Jesus, I see someone who was free, who lived their lives in a way that they were other-focused, that they were outwardly centered, um, but they never lost themselves in the midst of that. I think that's why so many times you and I are afraid to step out in our gifts. We're afraid to love other people because we're afraid that we're going to be, get lost along the way. But Jesus never lost himself. He always maintained a sense of who he truly is in light of his Father's love, 
that gave him permission to give freely because he wasn't looking for an expectation of return necessarily from people. His love was truly unconditional because he knew who he was. He knew that the Father was already pleased with him. Um, And so Jesus was able to live this incarnational life where he was fully present to the people that he was ministering to without losing his sense of self while deeply being connected to the Father. And I think that that's the goal for all of us. And you and I, we need to trust when we demonstrate our gifts, when we practice these things, when, yes, it costs us time, it costs us money, it costs us our resources, it costs us um, some of the protectionist sort of boundaries that we have in our lives. To be set free from those things is to become more fully ourselves because that is what we see in Jesus. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about hospitality Um, We're going to have a moment for you all to discuss what that has looked like in your life. And then we're going to switch over to giving. So we're going to begin with a gift that I adore and in my old age I'm finding far more value for. And that is the gift of hospitality. Um, The the gift of hospitality celebrates in others uh, the fundamental worthiness of being human. Now one of the things that I was thinking about with hospitality is we often uh, reduce it to, oh, somebody is a homemaker, somebody likes to cook for people, have them over to their house. And while all of those things are so often true, I think that's very often limiting of the real spiritual value of what the gift of hospitality offers us. And again, specifically in what it speaks to us about the heart of Jesus. What we see in the life of Jesus is a life of hospitality and kindness. That Jesus um, was uh, welcoming to all people, even the despised people. And what we see at the core of Jesus' ministry, whether it was in healing, raising people from the dead, whether it was sitting and having meals with them, engaging with them in the temple courts, whatever it was, is Jesus always saw people as inherently worthy of dignity because they're human beings. Even when that sometimes meant that he was to challenge them instead of affirming them uh, in the way that you and I might think. I'm thinking about you know, the Pharisees and, and some of the people that really came to debate Jesus. He always offered people the dignity of what it means to be a human being. And so I want to look at a story that I think so beautifully uh, demonstrates the spirit of hospitality that we see in Jesus. Um, this is a story from Luke chapter 9. This is verses 1 through 10. So let's take a look at this story. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I love this story. What a beautiful little vignette that we capture this this angle of the heart of Jesus towards despicable people. Zacchaeus was a despised person. Zacchaeus was a, a tax collector, which essentially meant for the Jews, he was a traitor. He was a Jew that was working for the Roman Empire. And not only was he working for the empire, the enemy... Um, But he was also skinning a little bit off the top, so he's profiting off his own people. So Zacchaeus was a pariah within his own community, Um, which is why you can almost imagine as his story is unfolding, he's trying to bump through the crowds. Maybe you've seen this in children's uh, depictions of the story or whatever. People aren't really giving him a lot of space because they don't value him, so he ends up having to climb this tree. And Jesus sees him and looks him in the eye and calls him by his name. You know, and... Our names are the source of our dignity and humanity. That's why I think in this kind of Black Lives era matter, it has been so important that we say names because we're not talking about statistics. 
We're not talking about numbers on a sheet. We're talking about real human beings who are inherently worthy of being valued uh, in and of themselves regardless of anything that they've said or done in their lives. And so Jesus tells this man that he's going to come to his house. And again, oftentimes we think of hospitality as welcoming someone into our space. But just as often, those with the spirit of hospitality are able to enter into other people's space and yet still make them feel welcome and valued. And so Jesus eats with this man. We don't know what the conversation is like. But we do know that the judgment from the people outside, that they reduced Zacchaeus to an ideology. They reduced him to being a sinner, not worthy of uh, the attention of this fantastic rabbi that's traveling the country. Um, And it's fascinating to see that Zacchaeus stands up and makes this declaration before Jesus that he's going to give away half of his possessions and repay everything that he's taken. And I can't help but think that it's the hospitality of Jesus that saves Zacchaeus' life. That it was just that kind act of seeing him as a human being above and beyond everything that he's done wrong or, or where his status is in society to sit, to eat with him, to offer him the dignity of presence and company becomes the very thing that saves Zacchaeus and his household. Now, when we take the idea of hospitality and we blow it up to that level in our society today, I think we begin to see how imperative hospitality really is for the saving work of Jesus in our time and era. Because I think one of the biggest questions in this incredibly polarized environment in which we live is that how do you offer decency to people that you don't agree with? Because if we're honest, if you're honest right now, As you read the news and you engage in society within your family, friends, work, environment, people that you see online, it is so easy to reduce people to those kind of dismissive little idioms like the Jews used against Zacchaeus. Oh, look, he's eating with that sinner. He's eating with one of them. He's spending time with them. And our ideological lines dehumanize people. And that, I think, is where the gift of hospitality becomes imperative. But the trick is, how do we begin to offer decency and dignity to people with whom we don't agree? I was reminded this week, as I was preparing for this message, uh, of the story of Daryl Davis. Many of you are perhaps familiar with uh, Daryl. He has a fantastic TED Talk from several years ago that you can find online. And I highly encourage you to do so. Um, Daryl is a, a, an African-American man. He is a musician um, who, when he was very young, moved to a small town in which he was one of two little black boys. And from a pretty early age, began experiencing racism from the people within the small town that they lived in. And he was so confused when his parents sat him down to try to explain racism. He said, I couldn't understand why someone would judge me because of the color of my skin. And he said, very early on, he developed kind of this life pursuit, this question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And as Daryl uh, grew older, he's, he kind of embarked on this very uh, dangerous journey where he decided to go to the very people that hated him most and to try to find out what exactly is going on in their lives where they hate me so much, uh, but they don't even yet know me. And so Daryl had his secretary reach out to the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan at the time, who is the kind of national leader. And they set up a meeting, and he engaged with this guy. And initially, there was a lot of fear and terror and and ideological lines being drawn in the sand. Um, But before long, they developed an incredibly unlikely friendship. And this imperial wizard maintained his ideas about white supremacy and about black people, but always at the beginning kind of created exemptions for his now friend Daryl. Um, And over years of building friendship, eventually this man was able to enter into Daryl's home without his bodyguard and eventually invited him over to his own house. And Daryl would frequently go to KKK rallies. And eventually it came to the point in this man's story where he left 
the KKK, and he gave Daryl his uh, imperial wizard garment, and he kind of renounced that former lifestyle. And since that moment, you know, Daryl started this process in 1983, he has convinced over 200 members of the Ku Klux Klan uh, to leave uh, and to, to renounce that lifestyle. And I, I, that, that story is amazing because what Daryl has uncovered in his life is that we fear who we don't know and we hate what we fear. And that's so often what happens is when we fear people that are on the other side. And, and so much of that comes from the narrative that we're receiving from our surrounding culture where we dehumanize other people because we don't understand them. And in doing so, we fear them. And when we fear things, we hate them. We want to get rid of them. And I think that's the radical nature of hospitality is that it enters into the spaces of fear and unknowing and seeks to make a human connection. You know, this week again, we've had another tragic shooting. Um, on Monday night, uh, Jacob Blake, um, who was apparently involved in trying to break up a domestic dispute between two women, um, was walking away from the situation and was shot in the back seven times by a police officer. And right now he's paralyzed um, and it is unsure if he's ever going to be able to walk again. Uh, and the following night, there was a young man... Um, Kyle Rittenhouse, a 17-year-old white ma young man from Illinois who drove up to Kenosha, Wisconsin to be present in the protests in the name of defending property who ended up shooting and killing two protesters and injuring another. You know, and it, it, number one, it's so hard to remain sensitive um, and to feel the weight of these things as they so continually happen. I think many of us are beginning to understand what our black brothers and sisters are, have been struggling with for so long in the sense of uh, just fatigue, of the wave after wave of these things happening around us. But we have to maintain that presence of mind to see what is really going on. And these are human beings that are caught up in a world that is dominated by violence and oppression. And the moment that we lose the human nature of these stories, they become statistics they become uh, just one more wave in the news and we miss what God might be trying to say. And you know, this week as I've been meditating on the stories of Jacob Blake and then Keith Rittenhouse, two men that are perhaps on the opposite sides of, of the racial divide, maybe the political divide, we don't know all the details. I can't help but wonder what does hospitality offer in those spaces to enter in with this the kindness that's present in the heart of Jesus to offer people the dignity of being human beings, to cross over the divide and to seek to find commonality and togetherness. You know, in our polarized era, it's so easy for us to reduce people to the ideological threats that they have for us. But that's not the way of Jesus and that's not the way of Christians. Jared, do you want to come get your cup of tea here? That's not the way that we're called to live. We're called to be hospitable, um, to offer up our space, our time, and our resources. Take a Jaffa cake there as well. Yeah. yeah. Daniels, would you like to come and have some tea? To see the inherent dignity in human beings, to enter into that space incarnationally as Jesus did, to not reduce people to these roles and these titles that make us hate them, that make us fear them. Here you go. But rather to enter in, to hear their stories. And maybe we don't agree with people, um, but at the least we see them as the precious children of God. There you go. I believe that hospitality could actually save the world. I believe that as we gather around our tables, as we engage with people, as we share time, as we share food, as we listen to stories, as we laugh together, as we weep together, these are the kinds of actions that could actually save the world, not least of which our country, which is so, so, so divided right now by ideology. In my old age, I'm really beginning to realize what truly matters in life. The joy that comes 
of welcoming people into my space, of sitting with them, of being curious about them, of being kind, of finding out why they believe what they believe, of sharing my own perspective in um, fixing meals for people. You know, even last year, my Christmas present to myself was to buy a bigger dining room table because I wanted to fit more people around it. And I think as we're all getting older and we see the imperative need for salvation in the world today, I think we could all deal with that heart of hospitality just a little bit more. And so if that resonates with you, if you feel like you have that heart of hospitality, I want you to go ahead and just give us a little shout out in the chat Uh, in our online church platform so that we can celebrate you because you're leading us in the way of understanding how it is that we're called to live. I think some of the common traits of people that have the gift of hospitality is that these are people present within the church who really seek to make this a community and a family first and foremost. They see people, they gather people. It's not about running programs and it's not even just about creating spaces for people to function in, but spaces that where people feel at home and they feel connected and they feel like they're being offered the dignity of being a human being. People with the gift of hospitality are excellent at creating these kinds of welcoming environments. I think about our engagement team and, and, and the wonderful work that they've done in the past with our lobby and kind of creating that space. I think about people like Brandy, who coordinates our kids' ministry, who um, you know, wanted to set up this beautiful picnic a few weeks ago for people. I mean, I think about so many of you that have welcomed me into your home, have, have cooked for me and, 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 and shared your life with me. Um, and those things that remind us that we are human at the core. And one of my favorite things I think about people that have a gift of hospitality is the specificity and particularity that they learn what is it that makes you feel like a human being. And I want to do that for you. Growing up, I was really uh, thankful to have parents that were so hospitable that every holiday we were always welcoming in people to our table who perhaps were lonely, who didn't have family who were uh, far away from home and always extending the table, welcoming those people into our house so that even from an early age, I recognize there are no strangers in the kingdom. There's only family that has yet to be realized. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to, there's going to be a question that pops up on the screen. And I want you to take two minutes and really think about it, but share some stories um, in the chat around this question. When have I experienced radical hospitality? And how did it feel to be seen as a human being with dignity? So let's take a moment and let's discuss.
So I hope you were able to think about the moments where you have received radical hospitality that's reminded you of your own humanity, your own dignity, because I think we need those kinds of stories to encourage us to offer that to other people. And I think it's such a good example of, you know, where some of us are specifically gifted with hospitality. It's something that all of us are called to. And indeed, the people within our community who demonstrate that gift are leading the conversation in something that is for all of us. And so that leads us to the second gift that we're talking about today, the gift of giving. So people with the gift of giving show us that everything we have belongs to God and can be used for his kingdom. You know, we're all called to live a generous lifestyle. Again, we don't silo our spiritual gifts like these are the generous people and those are the hospitable people and those are the people that are called a pastor and we don't do that. Um, but it's, it's, we're all interconnected and learning from one another. And as the gifts are more fully on display within the community, we begin to discover the heart of God present in all of it. But there are those among you where the gift of giving comes really naturally. And and generally speaking, if you have a gift of giving, it's usually in one of three spaces. It might be a, a generosity with your time. It might be generosity with your resources. Uh, or it might be generosity specifically with your money. People that have the gift of generosity, it's usually one of those three things. Now, a lot of times when you see these spiritual gifts assessments and lists, and again, you can go and take our assessment online, um, you might see uh, poverty listed as one of these gifts, which I think is rather intriguing. I believe that poverty is a vocation that some of us are called to in order to further the kingdom. But I think for us within the kingdom, poverty means something a little bit different when we're talking about the economics of the kingdom versus the economics of the empire. Because many of us, when we hear poverty, we think that that means people that don't have stuff, um, people that are called to live without any attachment to material goods, meaning specifically don't have any material goods. Um, But within the kingdom... People that are called to a life of poverty, it actually means that they recognize um, on this deepest level that everything they have been given is given from God that flows through them and is offered to other people according to his purposes. And we see Jesus kind of giving us this paradigm shift from the economics of the world, of the empire, to the economics of the kingdom. So this is just a little story, again, in the Gospel of Luke, Uh, in chapter 21, the first four verses. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. And these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. You know, a lot of times when we think about people who are generous, maybe you consider yourself generous or you're thinking about people in your life, we tend to measure people's generosity by the amount of stuff that they've got, how big their bank account is, how many assets they have, whatever it might be. Um, But that's very empirical thinking when we think about giving and generosity because that's not the way that Jesus gauges it. And I've actually come to recognize in my own life, and perhaps you have as well, that sometimes the most generous people can be the poorest people that seem to have the littlest, while uh, the most miserly can be those who are rich. Yet at the same time, I know specifically several people who are very financially well off that are incredibly generous, and people who are suffering from poverty who are not. And so what we find in this story of Jesus, he's recognizing in this woman It's not the amount that she gives, how much it is compared to what she owns, or how little it is compared to what other people are giving, but it's what that giving costs her, that she put in everything that she owns. She values God so much. She values the work that God is doing in her community so much that she would give everything for that. It's not about how much or how little she could give. It's about that generous heart that she demonstrates to us. 
And I think, unfortunately, because of our empirical notions, we're bringing in the ideas from our culture about money specifically, but also about time and our resources. We tend to apply those same principles to the church and to the kingdom. And that's where we see a lot of unhealthy giving in the church. That sometimes unhealthy givers have this unexpected return of investment. This idea that I'm, I'm going to give into this thing so that I get out of it. Or worse still, I'm going to give into this thing so that I have control and I get to have a say in what it becomes. And that's where we see money is a form of control and of power because that's how it's done in the empire. And I think that that's so unfortunate when we bring that into the church because what it ends up doing is Sundays, specifically, this place where we gather together, become a pay-for-play thing. That me as the pastor, I have to sing for my supper, and I have to sing for Daniel's supper, and I have to keep hitting you up for money, and I have to keep doing the song and the dance in order to, to, to get you impressed and to continue to um, you know, give you enough of an entertainment value so that you'll invest in this thing. And it becomes very transactional. And I think that's so unfortunate when that's the way that we hold the place of generosity. We have to understand divine economics, kingdom economics, God's economics are not like that of the empire. And I think people that have this special gift of giving, it has nothing to do with how much or how little they have, but the heart of generosity that they demonstrate. But it should wow the rest of us in what God is actually capable of when we all have truly generous hearts. And so people that have a gift of giving are often able to be identified because they're able to find creative resources to support the vision of an organization or a group of people or whatever it might be. But people with the gift of giving also have this amazing ability to trust that God will, be provide, will provide while also being actively involved in what he's doing. You know, a lot of times when we think about wh whether or not we trust God, it comes to, well, am I going to do it or is God going to do it? And so to trust God means that we're pretty passive and we're just sitting, waiting, twiddling our thumbs, waiting for God to do something. You know, our church maybe is in that situation right now with our finances. You know, we were six and a half grand short last month. Like, you know, our finances are dwindling. And do we sit and twiddle our thumbs and just wait for God to do something? Or do we actively participate in God as a sign of our trust in him to see what it is that he desires to do? And it's the people that have a really healthy gift of giving that are able to do that. They trust God, but they're also actively participating in what he's doing. There's a wonderful example of this that I've mentioned several times before in the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul is writing to this church to kind of encourage them to follow through on the giving that they said that they, were, they had promised to the church in Jerusalem. And they hadn't come through for it yet, so Paul's circling back around and he wants to tell them the story of the church in Philippi. So the church in Corinth, very well-off church, a lot of resources, a lot of money. They've made this big promise of, of sowing into the church in Jerusalem. Philippi, it's in the sticks. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, very small, poor church. And initially, Paul had said to them, don't worry, you guys are exempt. The other churches will cover it. And they came back and they said, no, 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 no. We really want to sow into the ministry of our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. So that's where we're jumping in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. When was the last time that you urgently begged somebody for the opportunity to give? If we're honest, usually we're coerced into it. If we don't automate our giving, we just, we just wait until we're being chased or begged in order to give. But people that have 
that spirit of giving, I think this church demonstrates this gift, said, no, 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 please do not rob us of the joy that it is to sow into what God is doing in really practical ways in our brothers and sisters in another town. And I, I especially, this phrase just confounds me, like this paradox that we see in the church in Philippi, that their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, that they had nothing, but they have joy and they have poverty welled up in rich generosity. And it's a beautiful kingdom paradox that poverty and generosity can go hand in hand, but that paradox only works when there is overwhelming joy, when we recognize it is a privilege to come alongside of God in his rescue project for the world. It is not an obligation for you and I, when we give of our time, of our resources, of our money, when we worship, when we gather together, if we perceive these things as obligations, checks that we have to, to, to get off of the list for the day, it will never bring us joy. And indeed, we will find ourselves drifting from it. But if we recognize that these things are all joy, because it brings us closer to God, it brings us closer to one another. We see the kingdom advance in our day, in our age, out of our poverty comes this tremendous generosity, then we are living that beautiful kingdom paradox. Because it's not about how much or how little you give, but have you settled in your heart to be generous? I'm constantly haunted by this quote from Mother Teresa, she says, I found that the paradox, that if you love until it hurts, there can be no more hurt, only more love. And I wonder if we were to creatively and carefully, led by the Spirit, apply that principle to our time, to our resources, and to our money, if we would find that we actually increase in our capacity. I have found the paradox that if I give until it hurts, there can be no more hurt, only more giving. People with the spiritual gift of giving help to break us free from this culture of miserliness and fear and finding our identity and our security in the things that we have. And what it actually does is it sets us free from what we call mammon, the god of economic worship, the god of money. Jesus speaks about money more than practically any other concept um, during his earthly ministry because he knew it's one of the things that enslaves us the most. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about giving and he says, don't worry about whether or not you'll have or you don't have and don't store up kind of compulsively because you're so afraid about the future. Trust me in the moment. Do not worry. And he says, you cannot serve both God and mammon which is to say you cannot worship the God and your bank account. You cannot worship God and the economy. And we're living in a society today who literally sacrifices human beings to the economy for the sake of getting the numbers up, for the sake of increasing our bank accounts. We dehumanize people by turning them into statistics or just forgetting that they exist entirely in order to sacrifice them to mammon, the God of worship or sorry, the God of the economy, that we worship the, the, Dow Don, the Dow Jones industrial, thinking that's a real gauge of the health of our community instead of it being about us caring for one another. And I think it's the gift of giving. It's this kingdom paradox of overflowing joy and extreme poverty that wells up in rich generosity that actually sets us free from one of the biggest fears in our lives, which is money that is responsible for us worshiping the Lord God Mammon. That didn't go the way that I thought it was going to. There we go. <laughs> Perhaps you need to give in order to be set free. Perhaps there's all these empirical mindsets that you have in place when it comes to giving of your time and your resources that you're so afraid. You're so afraid if you're generous as God is generous that perhaps you're going to be held back, that you're going to lose out. But can you trust God? Can you allow the givers among us to demonstrate a lifestyle that we're all called to live? As we transition back into worship, we're going to practice giving 
of our time. And some of you set up recurring giving and some of you give one-time gifts and everything is welcome. But I want you to think about that Mother Teresa quote, I have found the paradox that if I love until it hurts, there can be no more hurt, only more love. What is God calling you to today with your time, your resources, these things that he has gifted you with? Do you recognize that they are called to flow through you for kingdom purposes, that he will take care of you? You are more value to him than the lilies of the field. You are of more value to him than the birds of the air. He will take care of you and you do not have to worry. But in the meantime, we give out of joy and worship. So I'm going to pray. We're going to put up um, the, 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 the outline for how you can give, and then we're going to enter back into worship. So Father God, I bless everybody in our community who demonstrates um, the gift of hospitality um, that reminds us of our, the dignity of being a human being, regardless of what we believe or what we do. And God, I bless all of those in our community who, who de truly demonstrate the rich gift of generosity and giving, who give when it hurts, who give out of joy because they recognize that every good thing comes from you and flows back to you. God, I pray that they would lead the way in our community of all of us becoming more hospitable and kind and becoming more generous, that you would set us free from these harsh ideological barriers that we have been placed in because of our culture, that you would set us free from the Lord Mammon who seeks to, to control us through our money, through our bank accounts, through the Dow Jones uh, average, through statistics and through um, this, this, the way our economy is set up, that you would set us free from these things so that we could live fully into your kingdom here and now. So bless us, God, as we bless you. Um, please receive our tithes and our offerings. And all God's people said, Amen.
Well, thanks for coming out today, everybody. We sang some songs, we shared some stories, we had some tea, and we smashed some idols. Um, So just another wonderful Sunday. Uh, Thank you guys, everybody, for coming out. So two reminders. uh, Sign up for those house churches. I mean, talking about the gift of hospitality, my goodness, this is what we need. We need places where we can come together, where we can have the dignity of being human beings, where we can share this journey with one another. And if you don't sign up for one of our house churches, Grab your friends. If it's just two or three of you getting together to worship together on Sunday mornings, I think that will be so good for your soul. Um, So sign up for that on the weekly. And the other thing, today at 2 p.m., I'm going to be doing a Zoom conversation about the spiritual gift of teacher. So whether or not you think that that's a gift you have, you're welcome to come into that. I'll give a little bit of a refresher on what the gift is in general, but I really want to open it up for you to ask questions, to share experiences, Um, especially if you have the gift. I want to help you to grow in that. Uh, So you have to sign up for that. Go to citybeautiful.ch slash 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 weekly. So um, I want to pray a a benediction over you that is a benediction of hospitality. If you would, wherever you're at, you just close your eyes and open your hands up to receive uh, the goodness of God. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go forth in peace. We'll see you next week.